All right, um, I am pleased to introduce to you um, Emily Trichu. She is a clinical neuropsychologist with the VA Puget Sound Healthcare Systems Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, or what we affectionately know as the GREC. Um, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She has specialized in neurodegenerative disease and geriatrics throughout her career. Her clinical work and research has been focused on the full continuum of cognitive aging from dementia to super aging into the 90s and beyond. And since joining the VA, she's developed an additional and complementary interest in the care of older veterans with PTSD and cognitive concerns. And today she's going to um, talk to us about frontline tools, the three Ds, delirium, dementia, and depression in older adults. Thank you so much. Dr. Trichu, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you all for joining this evening or uh, afternoon, depending where you are um, joining from. I certainly hope you have some energy left. It's probably been a day full of clinic and Zooms and, and all sorts of uh, demands upon your time. I do have to run over the quick disclosure here, and that is that I really don't have anything to disclose. Nobody seems to want to pay me money to talk about drugs or things like that. So I have no um, financial interest other than what the VA pays me and the University of Washington. Views and opinions that I express here are my own. They should not be taken as some sort of official policy of either the US Department of Veterans Affairs or the University of Washington. So the great thing here is that uh, we've already introduced the four ends of aging. Uh, that's going to be a cornerstone, I think, of, of so many lectures that you'll hear throughout this series and others. Uh, it's, it's so important. You know, this, this spring series is focused primarily um, on dementia, which you can think of as really just being all about mentation. However, we really can't lose track of these other M's. They are so interrelated. Uh, medications probably seems pretty obvious. If folks are having trouble with their mentation, they are likely to have trouble tracking their medications, getting them reordered on time. Um, and similarly, if there's problems with their medications, say polypharmacy, side effects, one of the most common ones we see in older adults are changes in thinking as a result. Uh, mobility may not be quite as obvious as mentation or as obviously connected to mentation, but if you think about it, every time one has to learn um, to adapt to new changes, maybe having a tendency to have falls or um, just trying to get out and about your community, your mentation is going to either help support you with these new patterns and new behaviors, whether it's learning to take the bus uh, instead of driving or um, navigating a new environment, there's a real connectedness that's important there. And never, of course, losing sight of that top item, what matters. It's hard to keep that in mind all the time. We tend to be a diseased, um, disease focused system in our Western style of healthcare. But thinking about the person in front of us, what matters for them is really about the only way you're going to get effective motivation, another M, from that person to try to improve things that will help improve their quality of life. So I want to kind of, even though I'm going to be a little disease centric here this evening, I, I hope that um, we can all keep what matters at our, the forefront. So I do have some learning objectives. I probably do not need to read these over to you. Um, <clears throat> But I do want to be sure that folks come out of this talk feeling a bit more confident and recognizing certain signs of the th different 3Ds, some of the similarities, differences, really feeling a little more confident to at least initiate a diagnostic workup, even if that's not your normal job or, or flagging it for someone uh, for whom that might be their regular job. Also, how do you utilize the data that one might gather with screening measures and things like that to guide treatment and care planning? So I know these sorts of uh, why is this important types of questions uh, are, are talked about a lot in these kind of talks, but it never really hurts to think about what our aging population uh, is like. And this year, those oldest baby boomers, they're all turning age 76. And in eight years, all the baby boomers are going to be at least 65 years old. That um, overall percentage and actual volume of Americans here in the United States, age 65 plus, is expected to grow, um, not quite double, but almost by 2050. 
And the reason this matters to us, us as healthcare providers is that older adults do make up um, a higher percentage of our office visits, our outpatient office visits. They're often um, or typically a third of all hospital stays, all prescriptions, not a little less surprisingly, about 40% of emergency medical responses are for older adults. And um, also similarly, about 90% um, of our nursing home residents. That is a large number and meaningful. So thinking about the next, um, the, well, this was a, an article based off of the 2010 census. Uh, I just wanted to comment here that there are some shifts that we see over the decades. Um, this graph is a little confusing, but it's basically showing in millions, females on the right, males on the left, and the numbers at different ages by decade. So 2010 is the green, the dark purple is 2030, and then the lavender, if it's showing up for you here, is uh, 2050. So there are shifts that are happening. You can see how this bulgy part, that's the baby boomers, is shifting up in age over time. You can also see that more women are outliving men, and so the expectations are we're going to have higher and higher numbers of everyone in their 90s and older, but especially um, among women in the United States. And I won't belabor this point, but the percentage of folks who will be dependent upon others for assistance in some aspect of their activities of daily living is also going to increase, whereas the percentage of youths that are dependent is expected to hold steady. Uh, this, I put this on just simply to illustrate that there's a different, even though there's the numbers shift, there's also certain areas that have a higher uh, percentage of folks over age 65, and this is done by county in the United States. I do want to emphasize though, it's a little bit old right now. This is from 2013 to 2017, but you can see for our region, a number of concentrations in, um, uh, in Idaho, Western Montana, a little bit far Eastern Montana, certain counties in Oregon, as well as certain counties in Washington. It looks at first here, like maybe Alaska doesn't have such a high percentage. And it's always been thought of as a very young state. That is changing. So here is um, some differences between the census from 2010 and the census from 2020 in the states uh, that make up this Northwest geriatrics region, which also very much overlaps with the VA's Vision 20, uh, a region that includes Oregon and Alaska, but does not include Wyoming, which is part of this uh, whammy region for the University of Washington. So I just want to point out that all of the projections that were developed back years ago were all short, sometimes significantly so. You can see here that Alaska is one of the states that almost doubles its um, numbers of folks over age 65. Other states don't have the doubling effect, but every state is seeing notable increases uh, across our region. So how in the world are we going to provide care for this increasing and really changing demographic? The veterans that I see clinically uh, that are in their 70s now are so different than the ones that were in their 70s that I worked with a few decades ago. Part of that is a military culture um, and overall cultural shifts, and we, we need to be prepared for that changing demographic. Is it going to be met? Is that need going to be met by geriatric specialists? As much as I wanna do everything I can to enhance the geriatric workforce, that just isn't gonna cut it. There are complete um, specialist deserts in our country where there's no one who could help them, much less uh, to help enough of the people. So the, there's this thought, well, gosh, are primary care providers then going to carry all of that load? And they will carry much of the load. However, with the numbers and time limits for encounters, that's not going to meet um, older adults' needs either. So I'm not sure what your particular training environment or clinical environment calls it. With the VA, we call these PACT teams, the Patient Aligned Care Team. But basically, it's that interprofessional team that carries out all the different needs uh, to, to meet primary care needs for older adults. And that's really where it's at, this interprofessional approach and team approach to care. So I think um, that's really just my, my goal is to emphasize that there needs to be a paradigm shift in kind of who's responsible, what's part of a regular workup, and what's our diagnostic differential for older adults. This team approach is best. So changes in thinking with older age, let's talk mentation. 
What you might hear in clinic and what I certainly hear in clinic are things like this. I can't focus, um, or maybe a, a husband saying she's not interested in her, usually activity, her usual activities. What's wrong with her? I can't come up with the word I want. That'll probably happen to me a few times during this talk. Um, low energy, uh, maybe even some complaints about poor uh, selective attention, short-term memory being bad. I couldn't find my car in the parking lot. Uh, that's perhaps happened to me at the VA. Um, or even something that's a little bit more concerning, like, what are you saying? You didn't tell me to change my atenolol and stop taking the hydrochlorothiazide. So sometimes these things can have um, bigger effects than just a momentary glitch, right? So all of these, I think we could argue, are uh, red flags of some sort. Uh, it's good to recognize that. However, do they actually tell you what's going on? Not at all. They're, they're concerns, they're symptoms, um, and they're not specific to any one of the three Ds. So before I talk about the three Ds, I do think it's useful when we think about mentation to think about what might be really kind of considered typical cognitive aging. Uh, I try not to use the word normal aging, uh, although I'll probably fall into it at some point. I, I say that because what's normal or not is actually quite subjective. And heterogeneity and thinking abilities increases with increasing age. So as much as you can, try to think about the individual in front of you. And is this typical for them? What doesn't typically change as one gets older is one's ability to know your own autobiographical history, right? Did you have an appendectomy in your 20s? Did you um, with just, you know, anything that's going on in your life, maybe your medical care, recall of well-learned information, facts and figures, things that we just know. What's the capital of France? Ah, Paris, right? It, it's not that you would have forgotten that. You, you may take you a few seconds to come up with it, but you know it. Also procedural memory. Uh, so that ability to, without having to like mentally walk through every step, get behind the wheel of a car and start it driving. That is a, a well ingrained procedure. And until you get behind the wheel, say of a rental car that's unfamiliar, you don't even think about it usually. And also emotional processing. I like to emphasize that emotional processing does not typically change with age because I think our, our media and our culture has a lot of stereotypes about aging. You know, kind of you hear the phrase, oh, he's just a grumpy old man or she's a sweet old lady. And those are actually really ageist statements and, and inappropriate. The idea that someone's emotional processing and, and personality would change dramatically with age is inaccurate, at least in typical cognitive aging. What does seem to change though, um, and it does seem to be a bit inevitably, is uh, some decreased encoding of brand new information. Folks might be a little slower to learn tasks, maybe need another repetition. Being able to juggle and multitask like five things at once, uh, that, that usually decreases a bit with age. Um, and also um, processing speed, having to process things very quickly and respond quickly. Think about sort of reaction time, sort of almost along those lines. This is another um, slide of some data from a longitudinal study done looking at more typical cognitive aging. It gave a whole bunch of different neuropsychological types of measures to see sort of across the decades what, what changed in what direction. And you might be struck pretty um, immediately here, perhaps with the, 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 the warm colored lines, which are world knowledge, uh, things like vocabulary, um, and, and it's also markers of intelligence and experience. Those seem to hold steady. In fact, they're kind of going up here pretty much across the lifespan. Unfortunately, what you're probably noticing are the greens and the blues and the grays, which do seem to have a slow and steady decline. Although I want to emphasize, this is not as dramatic as the line looks in this graph. Um, and notice, these things actually start declining a bit in one's 20s. We often just don't pick up on it until you're a bit older and it sort of reaches, reaches a certain threshold where it becomes a little bit more annoying in daily living or where maybe that knowledge and experience and wisdom can't quite compensate for it as much. So we wouldn't even care about that so much, except that not all changes are typical. 
Uh, there are situations where certain areas of thinking will experience a more notable decline. Uh, sometimes that might signal a, a, a stage of cognitive impairment called mild cognitive impairment. At this stage, there are preserved activities of daily living. These glitches are annoying, they are troublesome, but they have not reduced someone's ability to live independently, at least not without some sort of you know, external aids and things like that. Unfortunately, that doesn't always lead to dementia, but it can, it's a risk factor for developing dementia. And I think um, most of us would agree that that is really what most people are coming into clinic if they're having cognitive concerns uh, and they're aware enough that they're having them, that's what they're usually concerned they might be developing. So of the three Ds, uh, I'll hit on dementia first. I know that Dr. Stephen Thielke gave a talk just last week about dementia, I think all about dementia. So I'm not gonna belabor it too much here except to hit on some of the high points. And that is that we wanna remember that dementia is a decline, a decline in ba from baseline in some aspect of thinking abilities and or behaviors. It has to be significant meaning there must be functional consequences. That's that decline in independence and in daily living. Uh, it also needs to be chronic. People don't get better who have dementia if that diagnosis has been applied appropriately. It's usually an insidious onset, kind of creeps up on you without knowing it. Although I will say many people have sort of a hallmark event where they thought to themselves, wait, this isn't typical for either me or for say, if I'm realizing it for a loved one. And then it does get worse over time, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, sometimes there are plateaus, but people don't recover from dementia. And then again, this loss comment here, it's just to remember, you know, if someone's always had a learning disability, you're not going to, or, or say had a head injury in their 20s that dealt them some sort of a cognitive blow. This is something now beyond that, not that static uh, impairment that they had from that. And in accurately diagnosed dementia, there is structural damage occurring. Neurons are dying, uh, whether it's due to a buildup of uh, protein pathology in the brain or vascular changes, uh, we need to keep that in mind. So it's cheeky of me to put this in here, but delirium is not, I'm sorry, dementia is not delirium, which typically has a more acute onset, affects attention primarily, and has lots of concentration problems. And it's not depression. Uh, there used to be a term pseudo dementia that folks would use for severe depression. And I don't really think that that's such, it's not used much anymore, but I don't like it <laughs> because I think it neither gives the dementia enough credit for what's happening. And it definitely seems to downplay the importance of the depression and the importance of treating that. You also wanna be very careful that you're not calling something dementia that's really due only to sensory deficits or maybe uh, communication problems after a stroke due to aphasia. And it's also not normal, typical aging. So what are the types of dementia? Here's a whole a bunch of them here. I put these and selected these really because they are the ones that if I see someone for a neuropsychological evaluation early on, the profile that I can get on extended testing can usually tease apart the, all of these here, um, but they're not all always so common. I wonder, I guess it's really hard to do the chat for this, but if folks wanna throw in the chat, which one do you think is the most common in older adults, folks over 65? You're right, it's, fast. it's Alzheimer's disease um, as the cause of the dementia syndrome, which is a clinical syndrome. However, vascular dementia is very, very common. Lewy body disease is not uncommon. Parkinson's disease, uh, it's not always thought about because the motor symptoms are so um, prevalent and debilitating at times. But when folks are older, especially if they've had Parkinson's disease for say 10 years or more, they have very high rates of having developed dementia as well. And then frontotemporal dementia is a uh, very uncommon, uh, but except that if folks develop dementia under age 55, it is about half as common as Alzheimer's disease for being the cause. So that's a bit unusual, but keep in mind, that's a very small percentage of dementia cases. So, but watch out, <laughs> there are lots of things that mimic dementia. That's kind of the basis for this talk, at least my um, reason for getting interested in it back in the day, is that there are things that can look like dementia. And if there is one of these syndromes going on, either like say a toxic metabolic syndrome, maybe a systemic illness um, or other such as um, post-traumatic stress disorder, 
uh, severe sleep apnea that is untreated, maybe alcohol and drugs are on board or a subdural hematoma. All of these things can look like dementia, especially with a one-time survey, um, but they can be treated, they can be adapted, and they can usually result in some improvements if they are the cause. And in fact, um, if they are acute enough or severe enough, they can cause delirium. Now, I say this, and I'm gonna talk later about an overlap in syndromes. So I do wanna emphasize that if one of these is recognized and treated, folks should be monitored because maybe those symptoms won't fully resolve or reverse. And that may be suggestive of some underlying early dementia pathology. We're not always sure. We have to follow people over time. So let's talk delirium. Oh, delirium. It's had so many names over the years. I do love that it seems like the geriatrics community is coming together to use delirium very consistently. Um, when I was in training, sometimes it was called toxic metabolic encephalopathy, or the, the psychiatrist wanted to call it an acute confusional state. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a medical condition, typically has a more rapid onset than you would ever see in dementia. There are almost always deficits in attention and concentration. Often there's a waxing and waning to that mental status to one's attention. And as I'm already hinting at infections, medications, metabolic abnormalities, those are the most common causes of delirium. And it is more common in older adults, even though people at any age can develop delirium, the incidence in older adults um, with less severe medical causes is uh, important to note. And those thinking changes sometimes can precede the objective signs of illness. And if this is one good take home message here is that it is under recognized, um, at least um, in its earlier stages before it becomes severe and folks end up in the emergency room. So it's really important to try to uh, think about delirium as a possible cause, even a subacute delirium as a possible cause for changes in thinking. So delirium is not insignificant. Uh, there is in uh, many, many, many articles that talked about um, and found that there's increased mortality when folks are followed, not just over six months, but at, up to two years later, they are still at higher risk of dying. Um, it's not dementia. It's also not rapidly resolving. Remember I mentioned those metal, mental status changes can precede say objective changes. So for instance, someone's got a UTI, they get confused and then not right away does the urinalysis show the signs of infection. infection. Um, and similarly, they may be put on antibiotics, but the, the um, signs of infection will clear up before they are cognitively cleared. So thinking about discharge planning, other things in clinic, you always wanna be sure that they are cognitively ready to be on their own again, if that's sort of their home uh, situation. And it's not normal aging. So what are the risk factors for delirium? That's always good to think about. Well, we, I think you all are probably aware hospitalization is, is a huge one, especially in older adults. It can affect up to 40% of older individuals who are hospitalized. Um, a, a great review and meta-analysis looked for the pooled risk factors uh, that led to delirium during hospitalization and found that having a dementia diagnosis already was a, a notable risk factor, the severity of illness, having visual impairment, um, needing a urinary catheter, low albumin, and uh, not surprisingly, longer hospital stays resulted in a greater risk for developing delirium. Looking specifically in a hip fracture sample, so they were not coming in for delirium, 35% though developed delirium at some point during their stay. And in that study, they found that age, independent of others, was a risk factor for developing delirium. Having had a delirium episode in the past was a risk factor. Overall health, um, having been uh, in either some sort of a, a supportive care um, setting before being hospitalized. Um, also, if they needed a blood transfusion or had low hemoglobin coming in. So to recognize delirium, here's just some of the things I think I've already kind of commented on these. The ones that I haven't mentioned, fluctuating sleep, um, being hyperactive and very agitated, or think about it, there's actually cases where people become hypoactive and seem sedated. 
Uh, with the hyperactive state, sometimes they'll be erratic, uncharacteristic, maybe even highly inappropriate behavior, taking off clothes in public, um, saying things that are um, inappropriate. Often folks will develop hallucinations. They're typically visual, not auditory, and may be paranoid. That makes it even harder to get folks in for care when things are, are in that state. Uh, somnolence sort of goes there with that hypoactive sedated version. And I think um, sometimes that gets shrugged off as being maybe just, de just depression or a worsening depression that was already in play. I've also unfortunately um, worked with, a, uh, saw a caregiver once who, when I saw them back for a cognitive evaluation, uh, her husband had been hospitalized due to delirium. And she said that, you know, in his early dementia state, he was just asking questions all the time, repetitive, repetitive. And it was, she said, kind of making her lose her, you know, at her wit's end. And so when he got really quiet and stopped asking questions and just sat, sat in his chair and slept, she kind of was relieved at first, and it wasn't until one day when she couldn't rouse him that she realized that something was very wrong and took him into the emergency room, and he was delirious. So I tried to help her with her guilt on that, um, but it is tricky because these things do overlap, um, and teasing them apart can be quite difficult. So thinking about depression, right? It's not unusual that people have changes in their sleep, maybe too much, too little, um, but it's overall a syndrome of psychological and in many folks, it comes across as, um, as, as bodily symptoms, right? Uh, a sense of increased pain, um, feeling low energy, maybe poor appetite, not enjoying things. Um, some of these things might seem more obvious than others, um, but we need to try to be aware that they all could signal depression. Depression's not just a bad day, a bad week, or even kind of a bad month. We've all had those. It's not natural um, and uh, the grief that's expected after a loss. Similarly, uh, a new diagnosis uh, might signal a, a reaction that is a bit of a depressive or sadness. It's just whether it goes on. And I already mentioned that it's not a cause as a, as a primary cause of dementia. And it's definitely not untreatable in older adults. And I'll kind of circle back to that. When we recognize, want to try to recognize depression, I do think um, there's all sorts of things that can signal it. I don't want anyone to ever just brush off when someone reports pain as being not real pain, but I do think that it's pretty common that when one is focused on um, a negative affect that one tends to endorse more pain, endorse more fatigue, maybe even more gastrointestinal problems. Uh, this, this next one, this bullet point about older adults being less likely than younger to admit being depressed, you know, that's kind of a blanket statement. Um, in some cases, folks might be better at admitting that they feel sad that they're depressed, um, but do keep in mind that everybody in front of you is different. They may use different terminology, right? Some person may call it that they have the blues. Other people may really dislike the word depression, but if you run down a list of everything that we use to define that depression, they'll endorse every one. So coming up with um, uh, language that is acceptable to the individual is important and always keeping in mind that as much as we would like our society to be more accepting of mental health um, issues, depression is often stigmatized. I find that I like to ask about mood symptoms in more than one way. Um, I kind of incorporate it into my interview as I'm asking about how someone's doing, but I also like to slip them like a little questionnaire that either they can mark off symptoms or circle a yes or a no. There are many people who are more willing to endorse mental health symptoms in writing than maybe in person. And especially if there is a loved one in the room with them while they're doing that. Um, although pulling loved ones in when someone is down is usually a very helpful way to initiate um, helping resolve the depression. So is depression significant? Yes, as many as 10% of adults who are over 65 who've been seen in primary care clinics actually have clinically significant depression. This is a light level depression. This is significant depression. And then the depressing thing is that only about 10% of adults with clinically significant depression receive treatment. Now that's complicated, um, it's, but it needs to be changed. There needs to at least be um, the offering of more than one method 
for folks to try to treat depression, simply saying, here's a pill or go talk to someone, um, especially if there's no warm handoff and connection is unlikely to achieve um, that person getting treatment. What is a pretty universal thing that can help with mood disorder is behavioral activation. Um, a, a recent um, and terrific, oh, actually it's not that recent, sorry, it's from 2012, um, meta-analysis of seven randomized control trials showed that moderate intensity exercise actually reduced depressive symptoms in a significant manner. And younger and older adults have been shown to respond equally well to treatment, whether it's psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy. So I brought up the behavioral activation and not everyone's gonna suddenly run out and do modern intensity exercise that they've never done before, but sometimes there's wait lists. Sometimes it's hard to get someone started or um, to get over the contemplative stage for treating the depression directly with psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy. In the interim, you can always um, recommend increased activity and that has a chance of helping right off the, um, off the bat. So in terms of thinking about psychotherapy and or pharmacotherapy, um, it's important to consider the medical comorbidities someone have. Um, best treatment options may not always be pharmacotherapy, depending what somebody's on. Um, although sometimes pharmacotherapy is helpful for getting folks who are very A-motivated to engage in behavioral activity and or uh, psychotherapy. I also want to give a small caveat. Um, more recent research has looked at psychotherapy and that there are some diversity issues at play here. The studies that have looked at psychotherapy may not be as generalizable as we would like. Most of those studies for late life depression have involved fairly cognitively intact, often well-educated, often white, and sometimes relatively younger older adult populations. So keep that in mind. It doesn't mean you shouldn't offer it, um, but um, it is a consideration. Here's a recent um, article from the New England Journal of Medicine that um, has a table on antidepressants commonly used to treat late life, late life depression. I am not a prescriber, so I wanna be very clear that I am in no way recommending any particular drug over another other than trying to adhere to the Beers criteria for avoiding inappropriate medications in older adults. Um, this author um, highlights um, some basic first line therapies that are commonly used to treat late life depression. And so oftentimes um, providers may think about starting there, making sure they're up to date with the literature on what's recommended um, and seems to be most effective in older adults is recommended. So it is worthwhile to monitor folks who have late life depression um, as they may or may not have increased medical morbidity. Depression rates go up um, and are as high as 37% in those who have um, had a post or just post critical care hospitalization. So maybe they don't develop depression while they're in the hospital. But if you're part of that team that's following up with them post discharge, keep in mind that there is sometimes increasing um, development of depression after that. Also, folks with cognitive impairment um, may have a less robust uh, response to antidepressants and trying to track that is useful. You also want to look for whether the person who has late life depression develops some cognitive decline later on, because there's a number of studies that have suggested that that can be a red flag for those prodromal preclinical stages of dementia. And last but not least, I do think that it's always important to remember that suicide rates are something to watch out for. They do tend, it's different region by region and, and person by person, but they typically tend to be higher in older adults. They also tend to be higher in veterans in males and in whites and uh, indigenous peoples, Native Americans. So swinging back around, thinking about uh, treatments for depression and folks who maybe have cognitive impairment, a lot of times folks go more with uh, trying to improve sleep, structured sleep hygiene programs, arts interventions, music therapy. These are, there are studies for all of these that have shown really good benefits. They may be small studies with smaller data sets um, and the standard outcome measures are not always as robust, but there is a really good evidence out there, especially say for art-based approaches like music therapy. 
Um, if there is depression with significant cognitive impairment, sometimes electroconvulsive therapy is considered, um, and that has been a useful treatment modality in a number of, it has been demonstrated in a number of different studies. So here's this uh, picture. I'm sure you all feel now with this table and what you've just learned that it's easy to distinguish these from each other, right? Um, it's really not that easy. Um, they all have these common features um, and the hallmarks are not always um, so easy to separate from one another. That overlap in syndromes, um, I'm just gonna throw out things from different studies, just kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall here. But one research article found that the rates of depression and dementia was anywhere from zero to 86% based on different factors. Uh, another study found that delirium superimposed on dementia occurs in 57.7% of, this is a hospitalization sample. And again, in older hospitalized patients, this is a really nice large study of those over 70. They sampled across and found that depression alone existed in over 25% and over a quarter of the folks. Delirium at that single time point existed in 8.5% and an overlap of both in 5%. Why do we care about things like overlap? Well, in this case, they found that those who had that overlap syndrome had higher odds of one month functional decline and nursing home placement or death at the one year post-discharge mark. So I'm gonna kind of present a case here. It's sort of an amalgamation. Um, it's, not a, it's not exactly a real case, but a very typical type of veteran I might see in clinic. This is a 66 year old veteran who uh, has been divorced uh, for two years from his second wife. And it was a less than five year marriage. And she's uh, not nearby because he's new to the primary care clinic having moved to be closer to his daughter. He has his own apartment and is living independently, but his daughter brought him in to his initial primary care appointment because she was concerned. He just sits around all day. He forgets what I tell him. Um, and as you can see here, we don't really have a lot of collateral information. When the veteran was asked whether he had any concerns or what he thought about his daughter's concerns, he just simply said, I'm fine. And that was it. Um, in terms of premorbid history, he does have diabetes and high blood pressure, but these have had historically pretty good control. So were there any red flags in that case? I think you've heard them. Uh, one that came up actually after some labs were done and vitals were taken was that even though the daughter and the veteran thought that the diabetes and high blood pressure were under good control, both of those were actually out of range, notably so. Also, that makes you wonder, is he taking his medications and insulin is prescribed? Is there something else going on? He says he misses his ex-wife, who actually he, he says he doesn't like her, but he misses her. Um, and he hasn't made any friends yet. He doesn't have folks to hang out with. And additionally, when you're talking to him in clinic, he doesn't seem cognitively sharp. He seems pretty disengaged. So those are those red flags. But I think given the basis of this talk, you know that you would never wanna to jump to conclusions here, right? One could think that a knee jerk response, especially if you're super busy and you've got a whole bunch of patients waiting and only 15 or 20 minutes to meet with the veteran, you might just think, you know what? I'm just gonna up your insulin and up your high blood pressure medication and then come back in a month, mm -hmm. right? You could see why that would happen. You don't want it to happen though, because there are red flags here and you wanna think about different next steps for getting further in to some of these concerns and things that you've picked up on. So initiating workup, or I should say, um, engaging in a more comprehensive workup. The thing is, is it's helpful to have tools. Uh, not every provider speaks the same language. You want things that you can share across clinics. Uh, maybe in your clinic, it's rotating primary care providers. Somebody different might see them next time. We can't be expected to remember all of the patients that we see all the time. So what are some of the identification and screening tools? I'm about to plug a 3D's pocket card that um, the National Aging and Cognition Education Work Group, formerly known as the Dementia Education Work Group, which is part of the National GREC 
system um, that I'm, I'm currently heading up. Um, I'm about to plug it, but I just want to warn you, or not warn you, but re remind you, I get nothing from this. It's a government product. Um, it's free. I will provide information later on by which you can order a bunch of copies for yourself. Um, and it is a new 2021 update that I'm showing here and that we have uh, original version. Um, the original, original version is actually over 10 years old at this point. It's been quite popular. So here's the little um, kind of intro that's on the card reminding you that um, you, there's lots of things that you should do, um, making sure that if there are unusual or atypical symptoms that maybe you're going to do um, a referral for specialty care, but that there's a lot that can be done when those are not present. We also at the VA do not recommend asymptomatic screening, but as you know so far with Joseph, there's nothing asymptomatic about what's going on here. The delirium panel um, has a bunch of descriptions just to remind folks of what they might be looking out for. It also has the CAM, which is the confusion assessment method. It's a, a, a diagnostic algorithm. We are actually currently working on finalizing a delirium specific pocket card, um, and that will break these things out in more detail. And in fact, that pocket card will have the BCAM, that's the brief confusion assessment method flow sheet on it. And I, I really love, I mean, an algorithm is one thing, but a flow sheet is even better, right? Because you start off with one feature. Is it yes, present or not, right? And you move on down the line. If you made it to feature three, there's a, a reference to the Richmond agitation sedation scale. I'll show you a version of that on the next slide. Things that can lead to um, a positive on the screen. Um, and even a little quick disorganized thinking cognition check that can also put you in a different direction, uh, put you in a direction either towards a negative screen or a positive screen. And then this here is um, actually a modified Richmond agitation uh, sedation scale. The original RAS was actually developed to assess level of sedation or agitation in an intensive care unit in the ICU. And so this version is the modification that was done for non ICU settings. And that's why I recommend it. Emily, um, there's been yes. a request about putting the updated pocket card in the chat, but I don't know that you have it in PDF form. Is that right? So the the plus and minus of a really cool little pocket card is that it, um, it is very easy to put in your pocket and for us to mail out to you. And it is almost impossible to create a PDF version that will print properly, right? Because it's these panels and it's on a very unusual um, uh, paper type. So I can um, make sure I'll, I'll present information toward the end so that I can send you a bunch of pocket cards. And then I do think somewhere I, I pulled some of the info and put it on just a P, uh, like a word document. Um, but it isn't very useful when it's not laid out in a sort of a systematic manner. Uh, when working up delirium, I think as much as one can, actually working up all of these collateral sources of information is helpful. We don't always have that, do we? Um, but if you do, um, the daughter say maybe she would have noticed if she's hung out with her father for a whole afternoon, some changes and fluctuations. Um, unfortunately, in Joseph's case, we probably don't have that kind of collateral information. Um, thinking about his full medical presentation, labs, things like that is useful. And then uh, I know this is an awful acronym called I Watch Death. And I learned it when I was in graduate school because I was part of a school of medicine program for um, training new docs. And all the MD students use this one. And I do hold on to it because I Watch Death is very much what trying to catch delirium is about because delirium does have such high risk of mortality associated with it. So kind of a little flip, but um, I hope you take it in the spirit in which it's meant. Joseph's workup for delirium was negative. Um, that did not uh, turn up anything. So what about depression? This is something I feel like I battle a bit, and that is you do not need to be a mental health professional to ask about someone's mood, to ask about symptoms of depression. There are great tools out there, and if you use uh, recommended tools, especially those that are validated working with older adults, they can guide you. Uh, the challenge, though, is to ask about it when you have an idea of what to do, some sort of a plan 
for how to triage this person in front of you if you get a flag, if you get that positive screen. Uh, I recently came across that uh, depression screening is something that you can um, code for and get covered by Medicare Part B. There are so many tools out there. I do often in a primary care setting recommend the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9. They are free and common. I'll show them in just a second. Also specific to older adults is the geriatric depression scale. It comes in a 30 item version, which takes a little bit longer to administer and it's a yes or no type thing, or there are 15 items that were selected for a short version uh, that can be a little faster to administer, but maybe not quite as sensitive. For the Veterans Health Administration, we um, have national mandates to not just screen for depression, but to always ask about suicidality. And that's important because the two are not synonymous. Um, folks with depression may have um, higher likelihood of endorsing suicidality, but they are not synonymous. So quickly jumping to the PHQ-2, it's a quick self-report screen. Um, and uh, I personally don't, I, re I feel like if you're gonna give this, you might as well give the PHQ-9, but depending upon your setting, maybe this is all that you have time for right away. And you basically ask people over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by these problems? And it's little or no interest or pleasure in doing anything. So that's kind of that anhedonia, loss of pleasure or feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. There's a kind of a lot packed in there, right? Um, and so sometimes people would be endorsing nearly every day for feeling down or depressed, but they may not feel that hopeless falls in with that. So that can get a little tricky, but have people circle. If they're cognitively impaired, sometimes this is a little harder to hold on to if they don't have it in front of them with the headers for every um, portion. And if someone gets a three or greater, definitely it merits completing the PHQ-9. So the PHQ-9 is the PHQ-2, see those first two questions, with seven more that get in a little bit deeper to some of the common symptoms um, that are indicative of possible depression. And there are um, items that are also red flags for possible suicidal ideation, number nine being um, the big one, thinking that you'd be better off dead or wanting to hurt yourself in some way. Hopelessness, though, is another um, a big red flag for potential suicidality. So Joseph's work up here was positive. He definitely endorsed significant symptoms of depression. Um, he was referred for mental health treatment, um, which you know I was pleased to see. He um, actually was able to get through primary care. At the VA, we have a primary health care integration team um, because he kind of had some stigma about having depression. And it also um, allowed for ease of access. He was able to do that warm handoff. And he didn't actually get an appointment with one of the uh, mental health counselors in that moment, but he actually was able to see them, get that appointment set up for a week from then, and, and then able to make that connection. So he was not suicidal though. Um, and in fact, I'm sorry, I could show this. We went ahead and did the um, Columbia suicide screen. Ah, am I losing my acronym here? I think I'm forgetting my full acronym, um, but it's the Columbia um, and it's a, a, a risk um, assessment for suicide. It asks both about whether someone has had these uh, feelings, uh, wishing to be dead, um, suicidal thoughts, either in their lifetime or in the past month, yes or no. You really, it's important to ask both about current, but also past. In Joseph's case, he is not currently experiencing suicidal ideation and has never experienced it. So shifting to dementia, um, at the VA, we promote the red flags method. Um, we don't believe or suggest that every person over a certain age should go get a full dementia workup, but you might notice here that these are examples of the red flags, um, and, and there are a lot of them, and um, a high, high percentage of the older adults we see in clinic may have one more or many of these flags, in which case um, doing more workup is highly appropriate and, and kind of mandated. So things like the clinicians may notice, um, someone may start having no-shows for appointments and they never missed them before. Maybe they're showing up on the wrong day, wrong time. Uh, maybe in an interview, they just turn to their, their loved one and have them answer all the questions. Um, maybe someone who always looked um, pretty snappy as a dresser is now either not dressed appropriately for the weather or their clothes are dirty. Maybe um, there's stains and they have their signs they haven't been washed regularly. 
Um, also, the patients themselves or their caregivers may report those repetitious questions, maybe even becoming lost on a walk or in familiar places, having trouble following directions, getting confused, which of course is tricky then with delirium, also maybe uh, troubles with self-care. So these things are all red flags um, and, and indicate a need to try to assess for thinking ability. But if you're in a non-specialist setting, you know, how do you get that objective information on the person's thinking? There's a lot of different tools out there. Um, I always recommend if you've got to do something that's very quick, um, if this is just a screening tool, the mini cog is, is helpful. It is not something that can be used alone though to diagnose dementia, especially given how short it is. Your goal is to get the patient's attention. This is on the pocket card, by the way. Um, get their attention. Give them three words that you want them to remember. You have them say the three words, uh, banana, sunrise, chair. Uh, they get three chances to try to repeat all three words back. Um, and then you would have them uh, draw a clock for you. The nice thing about this version is that you give them the phrases bit by bit. They don't have to remember the steps. Um, and then when they're done drawing the clock and putting uh, the, getting the shape there, you ask them to put the numbers in. And then when they've done that, you ask them to set the hands on the clock. They do have a time limit on this. They just don't get forever to do it. Um, and at that point, you should ask them, what were those words I asked you to remember? There are no points for learning the words. There's two points for a clock, um, zero for any error, one point per word, a max for three. So the total possible score is a five. Now, the scoring system, there's uh, zero to two points total suggest possible impairment. And the argument here is that three to five suggests no impairment. I don't totally adhere to that because if I had someone with a grossly abnormal clock, even if they remembered all three words, I would still be very concerned because not all cognitive impairments with dementia, with other problems are necessarily always memory, right? It could be in the visual spatial domain. So I think more workup would be um, indicated. Uh, so here was just a picture of, the, of Joe's clock. Um, I don't think I'm gonna read through all of those details, especially as I look at the clock. There are lots of other brief cognitive measures. Um, I do prefer ones that are at least 30 points or more. Um, the slums is one that was developed um, through the VA, so it is completely free. Um, but because VA providers are often overburdened and we don't really get research money to develop tests, it doesn't have as much research and as many publications behind it. It hasn't been studied in as many different populations. The original article is basically a bunch of older white men in the St. Louis area. Um, but it's still useful. Um, there are some guidelines for educational um, scoring methods and, and things like that. I just I, I encourage you to ignore that certain score means dementia. That's simply guidance that that could indicate that, not a diagnostic. Uh, the other test that people tend to be aware of or using is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. I love this uh, for the VA though. We um, don't have universal allowance to use it. The publishers of this, um, or the developers, I should say, uh, have decided that folks should be certified uh, to administer it. And um, that is a, a, a one-time fee to go through that training, which I think is pretty quick, but I believe the fee now is like about $150. Um, and so that may not be something that you're set up to do. Uh, other tests uh, that I know of that I believe are free, the blessed um, orientation and memory concentration test. I don't love the blessed because it's reverse scored. So a lower score actually is better and a higher score is worse. That gets confusing when you're trying to track people or compare um, when folks have given different tests. There's also the Addenbrook. Um, there's a modified version and then the most up-to-date version is called the ACE-3. This is a test that was developed in Australia. There is a US version or version versions of it, I should say. Um, and so maybe that's something that would be a good fit for your clinic. Uh, let's see, I guess I already covered some of the things about the MOCA that I wanted to. It is my preferred. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done using the MOCA in many different populations. Uh, so if you go to their references part of their website, 
you can search it and come up with pretty much every population, uh, whether it's Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis or you know any age group that this has been studied in. It comes in multiple English versions if you need to give it um, more than once, say within a week. Um, other languages, although the caveat there is, is if you're going to give a test in a different language, you usually need to be able to speak that language um, fluent enough to be able to administer and um, uh, use the responses. It has a nice uh, blind version, which also happens to be the telephone version. They have an adaptation for telemedicine, you know, that video technology, telehealth types of visits. Um, but as I said, they do want um, training and certification for that. Uh, let's see. The slums, uh, I kind of hit on some of this. It's important with all of these tests to use the standard instructions. I think I told you good news, yay, it's free. The bad news, there's really no training required. So that's not exactly a yay. Um, it does have a Spanish version, but it's worth noting that that is a Puerto Rican Spanish and may not be at all appropriate for someone from a different country who learned to speak Spanish elsewhere. There's also a Canadian version. I love that. Um, they basically changed uh, what state are we in to what province are we in and the city in a story that's in there from Chicago to Toronto. Um, I mentioned there's some cultural uh, bias, there's a socioeconomic status bias. Um, there's no official adaptation for telephone or telemedicine, but it's really not that hard to kind of basically create a prorate version where the telephone version would be a total score of 26 and the telemedicine to take those, um, the, the visual items that are on there and create um, some sort of a display where you could show them to people and have them respond that way. Okay, so many people are, you know, like, why would I use a brief cognitive test? And I think there's a lot of good reasons. Um, it's not for diagnosis, remember, but it is useful to get that quick sense of global cognitive function. It'll identify if there are gross deficits. It will also help you, help you if you have someone with some identified deficits to follow them over time in a, a fairly gross manner, but at least enough that if there's a dramatic decline, you would pick up on it. Also, Sometimes folks' cognition may drop to a point where we might need to question whether they have decision-making capacity. Say they're coming in and they have a gangrenous um, foot. Um, they need to agree um, and have capacity to agree to amputation or other procedures, things like that. You can imagine how in a medical setting, it's important to track that. Also, I think it's useful um, in a, and this will come up in my talk that's in a couple of weeks, thinking about cognitive concerns in primary care. How do we manage those, especially when they're not dementia um, or they're not something that um, we can do anything about? Um, one of the benefits I think for uh, identifying some at least mild cognitive impairment is that it can help motivate people to address any reversible influences or maybe some behavioral changes that they need to make regarding alcohol use or other drugs, um, maybe to assist with care planning in someone who already has a dementia diagnosis. And maybe if things have been ruled out um, other than a dementia cause, uh, perhaps even the early introduction of one of the medications that are approved for dementia. So uh, there are lots of caveats though to how much you can do with these cognitive screening tests. It's great to have a number and then somebody sees them again and there's gonna be some comparisons, but in terms of interpretation and appropriate populations, we always wanna think about the fact that there is decreased detectability for impairment in folks who either start off at the lower end of the average range or are below average, or those that are above average in the superior range for their sort of um, original level of abilities. And similarly, if someone has a learning disability or very low formal education, that can falsely lower scores. It might suggest there's a dementia when there in fact is not. Um, hearing and vision problems can obviously affect the test as well, especially if they're not detected or known ahead of time. For someone who has limited hand function, there will be items perhaps that they cannot do. So you sort of have to prorate again. And then one of the biggest take home message I just keep saying is there are poorest standalone measures. You need that informant collateral input. You need to think about other risk factors and the context. And in fact, what is the thing I have left out for dementia that we haven't assessed in Joseph? We've given him a mocha. He had a 25. That's kind of in the gray zone. It's certainly not grossly impaired, but it doesn't seem quite what his baseline would have been. 
So we need to ask about function, right? He supposedly is living independently in an apartment, but we don't know for sure um, unless we ask about other aspects of daily living. Um, on that uh, pocket card and available online is the functional activities questionnaire. There's tons of different measures out there for assessing what we call instrumental activities of daily living. I just really happen to like this one um, because it gets at some of these more complex cognitive tasks like being able to write checks, balance checkbook, paying bills, uh, maybe assembling tax records, it's that time of year, uh, shopping independently for groceries or other goods that are needed. Um, someone who is uh, an avid bridge player and now can't play bridge or at least can't keep track um, during a game and, and has stopped playing, that would be a warning sign, right? Um, doing some cooking, preparing healthy meals, keeping track of current events. That's one of my favorite sly little mini tests I give during the interview. Um, as I just say, hey, you know, what's been going on in the news lately? Now, sometimes that's dangerous um, because you may get some responses or opinions that are very different from your own. So do think about it before you ask it. Um, but if someone doesn't know of major events that are going on in the world and the news, um, even if they say they don't typically read the paper, that's sometimes a warning sign and, and important to think about, especially if there's someone who used to keep track of those things. Um, I won't read through the rest of these. Oh, but being able to navigate, to drive. Um, you can't just say, are you fine driving? Because everybody says yes. Um, but you ask, have there been any surprise scratches on the car? Have you... Um, found yourself having a hard time maintaining lane? Have you noticed that people are honking at you because you're driving too slowly? Um, things like that um, are, are a lot of the things that I ask about. So at the end of the day, dementia is always a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, we always wanna think about risk factors um, that may either be causal or could be maybe even possibly contributing. Um, this cartoon here, Mr. Potato Head has gone into his doctor, worried about his sudden onset of memory loss. And it turns out uh, that an MRI was ordered and it's that hat pin. Ha ha, okay. But you would never wanna miss that, right? If there's something that's obvious or something that uh, is reversible. Uh, on the back of the pocket card, we have a list of some of the additional factors. It's certainly not exhaustive, um, but some of the things that we've commonly seen as experts across the country that can impact thinking and daily function. Mental health is a big one. It's not always depression. Sometimes stress and anxiety can affect clarity. Um, sleep, uh, any kind of insomnia that, especially when it's chronic, has sort of a just insidious negative effect on cognitive performance. Um, and sleep apnea is probably my number one condition that either it's been diagnosed and the person does not want to or can't seem to tolerate their CPAP machine, or it's been missed in the workup and hasn't been identified yet. It's the number one thing I see in my clinic that is um, that really mimics early Alzheimer's dementia and is uh, treatable and therefore really important to catch. Uh, other items here, we actually, for the VA, we break out PTSD even further because those symptoms can even be more notable and they can crop up again or appear out of nowhere in aging. And that can um, lead to things that feel like early um, dementia, side effects from medications, poorly controlled medical conditions. And then this last one coming out of the pandemic, loneliness and inactivity. Don't underestimate the, um, the positive impact that social connectedness and um, being busy can have, and conversely, how much a loss of those things can impact people. And again, that would typically be a pretty insidious onset for those symptoms. Here are some of the risk factors that I'm, I've hit on a little bit, but also want to remind you to discuss, manage, and or avoid. Um, alcohol and tobacco, if you have a patient that hasn't quit using tobacco yet, it's never... Um, it's always worth bringing it up again. That is a risk factor that if they can stop smoking, they, within a certain time frame, can actually return their risk. Um, their risk of developing dementia can return down to that of those who never smoked. Um, alcohol use, a lot of my veterans have had their alcohol use creep up during the pandemic. Um, and frankly, their use was at a level that before the pandemic that was okay for their 40 year old self, but not okay for their 70 year old self due to changes in physiology, um, metabolism uh, and other nutrition as well. 
So I will probably focus on these more in my talk in a couple of weeks with some information about each one and sort of some suggestions uh, there. So I kind of use this three D's action plan. Um, it's to rule out, <laughs> number one, always think about potentially treatable causes of the cognitive changes. Uh, and then really, no matter what that result is, you want to monitor people over time. Um, those frontline tools maybe help you catch one thing early, but you might want to keep using them in case there's something else going on. And of course, if problems persist or worsen, you might need to consider further evaluation, whether that's um, referring someone for a, a brain MRI, maybe additional labs, um, and to potentially see some specialists. So back to Joseph here, as I'm getting closer to the end, we, um, this is just a recap of some of the things that we knew about him. We were able to very decisively, I think at least at that time point, rule out delirium. Uh, depression was identified as existing and treatment was initiated. Uh, but I do think that with Joseph, um, the jury was out for whether there might be a prodromal uh, dementia process going on. It was atypical of him to not have um, made any friends, to not have been tracking his blood pressure, um, things that maybe we could chalk up to depression, but just seemed a bit above and beyond that. Um, and so um, that MOCA of 25 made it worthwhile, actually at that time, for him to be sent to me for a neuropsychological evaluation. And I did diagnose him with mild cognitive impairment. So at the end here, here is an a cartoon of an aging Superman standing at what appears to be an open windowsill of a very tall building, looking back at Lois saying, dang, now where was I going? And the point with this is that, is it a sign of dementia? Possibly. Is it a sign of delirium? It could be that too. Also could be a sign of depression, not really caring. So thank you very much. I'm glad I have gone through this quickly, but we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, the large webinar, the webinar format here means that you typically need to either put a comment in, uh, either a question in or um, ask to be unmuted to ask a question. And let me see if I can pull up the Q&A. Don't see any questions that are in there as of yet. I don't wanna block I don't know if you all are seeing just my slides or if you're seeing my Q&A box too. Uh, they don't see your Q&A box. But, okay. Um, there was just a request about, again, about the 3D card. So I put this contact for Julie in the chat as Excellent. well. Um, so that people can, it's my understanding, they can contact her and she can ship them out. Yes, um, and of the we cards. just got uh, another big order um, from the printing, or we put in a big order to the printing office. I would like to give a shout out and thanks to the government um, Office of Rural Health for having provided our funding for printing for the last bunch of years. Um, we really, really appreciate that they do that. Um, so um, I don't know if you see the comment in the chat, um, and if you wanted to add to this, but um, um, Megan mentioned here in Alaska, if an elder has already been diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's dementia or other diagnoses recognized, um, just a minute, I just lost it, um, um, under dementia, the state still completes the three word and clock test. And after all these trainings about doing it correctly, it still raises questions about their training. It seems like with all the tests to provide that diagnosis, this is just something the state needs to stop doing if they have already been diagnosed. Um, and I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you have any additional comment about, um, you know, if there's been a diagnosis, if if there's a need to continue to establish it, I, I think is where that's coming from a bit. But Megan, Absolutely. feel free to clarify. I think that would be incredibly frustrating <laughs> um, because it's, it's like having um, a government entity question um, clinical care providers who are doing their jobs, um, especially uh, if the state is then administering something that's so cursory. Um, it would be unfortunate if they were trying to change a diagnosis or question a diagnosis on the basis of something um, so lacking comprehensiveness. Um, 
so yeah, it's really frustrating to hear. I wonder, is this somehow part, uh, Megan, of when they're trying to decide if someone gets disability or if they get, um, uh, sometimes there are entities, insurance companies and others that will require additional markers um, or questionnaires or forms from providers, uh, long-term Medicaid waiver services. Uh, that's an area that I'm a little less familiar with. Um, I'm lucky to have a lot of amazing social workers that I work with that know those services better. Um, but yeah, that's that's got to be very frustrating, especially that they're using something kind of, um, yeah. Well, and then I do see that there was a question uh, in the Q&A about asking if Park, is Parkinson's a form of dementia or only Parkinson's with dementia falls under the umbrella of dementia? And I love that question. That is a really, I don't know if you meant it to be as nuanced as it is, but it's a really highly nuanced question. If we think about dementia as um, if accurately diagnosed, the clinical syndrome and everything else is excluded, then we are narrowing it down to basically neurodegenerative diseases of the brain. And that also includes uh, cerebrovascular disease, right? So Alzheimer's disease is different types of pathologies in the brain. Um, Lewy bodies are the type of protein pathology in Parkinson's disease and also in Lewy body dementia. So the difference with Parkinson's disease is that when it starts off initially, that pathology is not in what we call the cortical regions of the brain. It's in a part of the midbrain that produces dopamine. So that's why those initial symptoms are typically just sort of the movement disorder but eventually those Lewy bodies will show up in other parts of the brain. So I do think it's kind of, um, it's a misnomer to separate out Parkinson's disease from Parkinson's disease dementia. The reason we do that clinically, it does have a purpose. It's because the dementia and the pathological changes, um, sorry, the pathological changes have progressed to the point where beyond the movement disorder, the person has cognitive changes such that they can't live independently or that there are things that they need assistance with that they no longer can do independently. And it's not just things like um, the motor symptoms inhibiting putting on clothing or feeding self, right? It's, it's the ability potentially to make decisions, to um, uh, do one's finances, things like that. I hope that answered the question. Let's see, who else, anyone? Other questions? Does anyone have a case? Um, you don't obviously don't share significantly identifying details, but has anyone had a case that was either particularly challenging or um, where you saw that overlap in symptoms and, and syndromes and maybe one was more prominent than the other, but you later caught that the other was, another was present. I think those are the, the most challenging. Well, I, oh, sorry, Barbara. Well, I was just gonna say, um, do you wanna give a little bit of a preview to just introduce the focus of your talk coming up in a couple of weeks? Yeah, uh, this is where I have to admit that I don't have that talk 100% finished. So this is actually your chance to put things in the chat that you would want to hear about, because I do have um, some time left to incorporate some additional information. My thought was to focus on basically how to manage the cognitive concerns, because not everyone needs a full workup. A lot of people don't meet criteria for dementia, but they are still very much worried about their thinking abilities. Um, and what are some of those healthy brain aging suggestions we can make? What are some methods for talking to people and providing uh, the psychoeducation that we hope will minimize some anxiety? Sometimes it's folks who say got that 30 out of 30 on the MOCA and they're not having trouble day to day, but they have a loved one who's had dementia. Maybe they're a caregiver for someone trying to communicate with them and figure out where they're coming from. It'll definitely pull in um, a lot of that what matters discussion and maybe even review some motivational interviewing techniques because I really haven't come across um, a patient yet who didn't have um, things they could do to mitigate their risk um, and, and to basically be healthier 
uh, and aging and, and helping them identify areas of their life that they want to experience more fully is often the way to kind of get at then what, what's best for them, what would work for them. No one size fits all. Uh, someone asked a question, what can we do for the 90 year old and older dementia population besides watch a slow decline? Oh, Carla, yes. Um, I think you're not just hitting on age in particular, but you're also hitting on folks who maybe are in the more moderate to severe stages of dementia. And, um, and, and it, is, it, it is kind of like watching leaves fall from a tree um, when the, the temperatures aren't swinging dramatically, but the light, the daylight's getting shorter and they're gonna drop no matter what. Um, so there's been, I certainly didn't coin this, but the long goodbye, is a phrase that's been used for when loved ones have dementia um, and other health problems don't um, inter, you know, kind of either hasten things or, or cause a hospitalization and passing. So I think the area to focus on there, and this is not so much what I will talk about uh, in a couple of weeks, although I could hit on it a little bit, is thinking about what gives someone some quality of life. Um, it is unusual that someone in the moderate to severe stages of dementia doesn't like music still or um, pet therapy and engaging in a useful task, obviously trying to come up with ones that are safe um, and uh, is, is good, but I, I know of caregivers that have just keep bringing out a, a basket of laundry and their loved one is quite happy to um, fold clothes and, and stack it. And, and it gives them something to do. Uh, I love, Judy just mentioned uh, Momentia. It's a grassroots organization um, where folks in their own communities organize and can do sort of memory cafes, get together, um, do art walks, garden walks, gardening perhaps is a really great thing. Um, the challenge during COVID was how much of this just shut down. It's been, it's been brutal. Um, Let's see. You see the Q and A. I do. I do. It's coming in hot and fast right now. Yeah. Um, sh um, I, I may. I may butcher your name. I apologize, Shaylee. Um, a question to, or says comments that she struck or sorry that they struggle with homebound patients who have been diagnosed with dementia, and um, are are kind of nonverbal but on antidepressants which they've been on for many years. That challenge of whether to leave them on it or attempt to taper off to decrease polypharmacy is a tough one. I do, I'm not a prescriber, so I want to be careful. I, most primary car, care docs that I know now um, are trying to taper things down and, and reduce polypharmacy. Um, obviously, uh, uh, as much as one could get a sense of what their mood is like, um, sometimes picture things, just happy or sad and ask them, how are you doing today? And if they're still hitting sad, maybe that might make you do less. Maybe if they're hitting happy, you do more. Um, things like that. I had never heard of Zinnia TV. I will be looking that up as soon as we are done today. That sounds really interesting. Um, and I appreciate, um, Shelly again is commenting that there's certain antidepressants, especially those that they, maybe they were on in their thirties and forties, but they've been kept on because it was what seemed to work for them, but actually are considered to be less, um, uh, advised in older adults, things like that. Oh no. Barb, am I breaking out? I, I'm not audio? hearing it. So I, I'm not really sure. Um, okay. Um, Oh dear, anyone that asks me to repeat my last few sentences in any part of my life is usually in trouble because I go so fast. <laughs> I can't well, she was just talking about Zinnia TV and, and taking a look at it. There's also a question from Katie Miller in the question and answer box. It would be helpful to hear about how SUDS affect evaluating cognitive impairments. Oh, Katie, what a great question. Um, yes, or Kate, actually, I'm just unsure we had, um, but so substance use disorders is SUDS. And I find that incredibly challenging. Um, and I find it important to try to put aside any judgment. Um, but when I do a neuropsychological, okay, thanks. Um, in fact, I think I know who you are. I think you uh, work with me at the VA, but so substance use disorders can always affect cognitive ability. It's kind of just part of par for the course because these are psychoactive substances. It's, it's actually often why people are using them. Um, the challenge is, is 
not everyone is going to stop everything. And does that mean you can't diagnose anything else? Well, of course not. Um, I think the idea would be is you, if you have someone in a primary care setting and you want to give them that mocha, you'd like to make sure that they didn't use marijuana right before they came in and they're not acutely um, affected, similar, you know, alcohol, things like that. Um, but at the time, and then make notes, right? If you get that score um, and you have accurately asked or at least gotten good information about their usage, um, it's not uncommon that I have veterans who are, have really started using cannabis a lot. They're using it before bed. They're using it when they wake up. Um, and it does make it harder to diagnose um, conditions like dementia. Um, I almost always um, try to recommend at least cutting back especially if the uptick in usage coincides with the development of the memory problems that they're concerned about. Um, so I usually try to tackle, this is where more than one time point is so helpful. And that can be the same thing for a MOCA as it is for a neuropsych evaluation. If they come in, they get that 21 on the MOCA, but they are drinking uh, a lot and they are getting poor sleep and they are using cannabis. If you can work with them to try over the span of say six months to draw at least bring all those things down, get better sleep, less alcohol, um, cut back on cannabis. And then you give them the, the uh, mocha again and their score has actually gone down. That's a red flag, right? There's something else going on. Um, or especially if there's no improvement in it. Um, and, and again, that's where we kind of have to work with the people that are in front of us and um, approaches to substance use um, treatment and disorders uh, like harm reduction and things like that typically get engaged. I do think that for, for individuals who have substance use disorder, this is sometimes where it is, if you can, uh, getting um, psychiatrists, getting more specialty care providers online is often helpful. It is harder. Okay. Okay, Let's thank you so much. This was just great. I always appreciate learning from you. Um, and um, it will be wonderful to have you back again in a few weeks uh, yes. to talk to us about um, not so much diagnosing um, the three Ds, but instead responding to cognitive concerns um, exactly. that folks may raise in primary care. Thank you so much. Thank we'll you. And there's my email address if you want to send me your suggestions or questions. I can, oh, great I can idea. Too. Yeah. All right. And we'll thank see you, you all everyone. next week. Thanks, Emily. Thank you.